Well, hello, and welcome to our Coping with COVID webinar series. I'm Dr. Wendy Smelter, National Medical Director of Wello, our telemedicine platform, and Medical Director of Live, our Calgary Clinic. And I'm really pleased today to have Maria Prairie, our Chief Operating Officer patient. Maria is an entrepreneurial leader with over 25 years experience across multiple industries. She's worked in many sectors, including healthcare, customer service, loyalty, and telecommunications. So really is very well versed in, in looking at some of the business aspects of returning to our so-called normal life. So today, what we're going to do is look at some of the considerations as we are starting to look at a first phase of reopening in many provinces. I'm gonna look at a medical update on COVID, some of the new things that are there, considerations medically. Maria is going to then look at some of the things to consider as you re-enter your workplace. And then we will have some time for questions and give you some resources at the end. So I'm gonna encourage you to use the chat button on your uh, webinar platform to uh, submit any questions that you might want to have us answer. So we all know we've been living quite differently these past two to three months. We've been working from home or not working at all. We've been staying at home or being in self-isolation. We've been social distancing when we're out, wearing masks, not traveling, not participating in the group activities we used to participate in and so on. And this has become our new normal. But now we're looking at a phase where we're starting to open things up again. And we want to explore what that means, what that means to you, what that means to your workplace, what measures we're still going to require and why. So in order to do that, I'm going to review a little bit of some of the medical aspects of this virus, um, tell you a little bit about what we've learned about the virus as this pandemic has evolved, some of the updated information that we have now, and what we still are learning or need to learn. So we have achieved a flattening of the curve. And that, what that really means is that we have controlled that initial rate of, of spread of the infection, and we've prevented a huge surge of infection as it moved into Canada. And this was due to the public health restrictions that were put in place quite quickly. Now, what we know and why that's important is we know that about 20% of infections actually get severe enough to require hospital care. So if we can flatten the curve and reduce that large surge, then we do, what we do is reduce the number of people that require hospitalization. And this allows us to ensure we have enough hospital beds, ventilators, and, and medical care to uh, treat all those infected that need that level of care. But flattening of the curve does not mean that the infection is over. We will continue to see new cases daily, and the virus will continue to spread, but we know now our medical system can actually handle it. Unlike some situations around the world where they really ran into challenges, such as Italy and New York City, where there was that large surge that overwhelmed their medical system. So to understand the impact of opening more services and businesses and some of the guidelines, I think it really is important to understand what we know about the virus now and what we know about these public health measures. So I think everybody knows this virus, uh, it's called SARS-CoV-2 and it's one of the coronavirus family. What, what is new that we know now is that there are actually two strains or two variations of this virus that have now been isolated. One seems to be more associated with that early stage of infection in Wuhan back at the beginning. And now there's another strain that's been identified. There are many studies underway right now to determine, does this really make a difference? Do they have different clinical outcomes? Do they affect in different regions? So these are under study right now, but there are two strains now that have been uh, identified. What we do know is it still is a respiratory virus. It's transmitted through respiratory droplets directly or through contact surfaces that have been contaminated with those droplets. We know it doesn't aerosolize naturally and uh, it's not carried in the air without mechanical means of doing that. We still know it's a heavy virus, so it really carries about one to two meters uh, with those respiratory droplets and then it falls to the ground. This virus only multiplies inside our cells, inside a body. So it doesn't grow and multiply outside the body, but it can live on those surfaces for a period of time. And that really depends on the surface. Lots of different uh, studies underway now to determine exactly, but what we're seeing that it tends to be um, with the, the hardness of the surface. So if it's paper, it tends to only, virus lives there a couple of hours. 
24 hours on cardboard, a harder paper, and then it gets up into the days on plastics and hard surfaces. It appears that by seven days, um, it's not on any surfaces at this time, but we're still learning. But what we don't know, even if it is on the surface, is how infectious it is over that time frame. Does it wane off? Does the infectivity wane off over time? But we do know if you have immediate contact with droplets on a surface, it's more likely to be contagious. So if somebody sneezes or coughs and gets droplets on their hands, they then touch a surface or an object, and then you go along behind and touch that same off uh, object or surface, you may pick that virus up onto your hand. And then if you happen to touch your, scratch your nose or rub your eye or touch your mouth, you can transmit that virus to yourself. As I said, there's no uh, evidence at this time that it aerosolizes naturally, but we know there are some mechanical processes, mainly through medical or dental procedures that can cause this to happen. And so extra precautions would need in those workplace settings. So this actually, that those basic characteristics of the virus really are the foundation of our public health measures. Um, we need to stay home if we're sick, even as things open up. If you're sick, any symptoms, um, it's important to stay home. And this is so that you don't spread your droplet secretions and uh, affect others and spread the virus to them. The second measure that is going to continue is social dis distancing. We need to stay two meters apart because we know the virus can spread that distance. And that prevents you from inhaling the virus from people around you and them from inhaling the virus from you. So this is why we will continue to see banning of large public gatherings, limiting the numbers of people for conferences, meetings, etc., through these early phases. And in a situation where it's not possible, whether personally or in a business, to maintain that two meter distance at all times, then there is going to be provisions for non-medical masks to be worn because that would prevent the secretions that you generate or that person beside you generates from spreading to somebody else. We know that through the next phase, washing hands will continue, not only just to remove the virus from your hands if you picked it up, but we also know now that soap itself can actually kill the virus if there's anything remaining on your hands uh, because it disrupts the outer protein coating of that virus. We also know that it will be continued to, to be important not to touch your face because it, it enters. Uh, that virus enters through the mucous membranes that we find in our mouth, in our nose, and in our eyes. So touching our face will increase that risk of transmission and we need to continue that. So I also wanna talk a little bit about the disease itself and what have we learned? Well, we know the incubation period varies, two to 14 days. Um, it seems that the majority are in that five to eight day period. We do know that about 80% still are milder disease, as we talked about before. And we know that the majority of the disease presents with cough, fever, shortness of breath, and flu-like symptoms. But what has also come about in the last uh, couple of weeks is that we know there are other symptoms that can also be associated with COVID. And there are some very common things, GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, Loss of taste and smell seems to be something that's fairly, fairly um, common, more than 50% of people with COVID. Exhaustion, extreme fatigue, and even pink eye or conjunctivitis has now been associated with COVID. So you'll see in many of the screening procedures now for COVID, it includes not just the respiratory symptoms. 20% we know still do progress, and about 5% of those actually get serious enough disease to require uh, ventilation and ICU support. The death rate is holding at about 2.3%, and we still know that people with underlying medical conditions, particularly some of the chronic conditions like diabetes, heart disease, uh, some of those uh, hypertension, um, and, and the elderly, older age, anybody over the age of 65, and particularly as we get into the uh, ages over 80 are much higher risk. But we do know that it can progress to serious and even fatal disease in any age. Children do tend to have milder disease in general, but they still can go on and get severe disease. And now we're seeing uh, an exhibiting of a very sort of signs of a very uncommon inflammatory multi-system disease that seems to be associated with COVID even appearing afterwards. And that's now there's a very large international study going on because children are only about one to 4% of the COVID cases. So in order to track that, there's a, a 
a very large study ongoing to try and see what that means for children. But basically, everyone is at risk. And if we look at why that is, it's because we, this is new, it's a new virus. Nobody's ever had immunity to this when it hit. So everybody is at risk of getting that. When we look at things like the flu, even though we get new strains every year, variation on an older strain, and we actually, because of the flus in the community, what we call herd immunity, and because of our vaccine program, um, that, that immunity actually transfers. So we don't tend to get the same infectivity or transmission rate in flus as we do with this new virus. We also know now that one of the major means of spread of COVID-19 is from community spread. Initially, it was thought to be linked with travel, but now we're seeing it is person-to-person -person spread. And we know that people can actually spread the virus because it's present in their secretions up to two days prior to the onset of symptoms. So somebody could think they're totally well and uh, be present with virus in their secretions and spread it before they know they're sick. Once they're sick, we know they're isolated at home and hopefully we prevent spread. But we know now a couple of days ahead of time that spread is possible. That's called pre-symptomatic transmission. And we also know some people get the virus so mildly or with no symptoms whatsoever and actually can have a viral infection with no symptoms and then of course be out in the community spreading that. So what we have to consider really as we move into this new phase, the virus is still there and everyone is at risk and everyone is a potential transmitter of infection. So I wanna just take a minute and talk about immunity because this has been a focus of questions. You know, Once we've had it, are we immune? Our immune system is our own system that works to produce antibodies or proteins in the blood when we have contact with something or exposure to something that's foreign to us. And these can be measured in the blood after approximately two weeks. We have enough that we can measure. Now we know that often these antibodies will give immunity or protection from reinfection with that same substance, but not all antibodies actually give protection. And even if they do, sometimes it's short-lived. We don't know how long it necessarily lasts. So these are the questions that are under study right now for this COVID-19 virus, because we need to know that information. Once we know, we can see whether the antibodies are produced after contact will protect from future infections or not. We don't know that yet. And we don't know how long that infection will last. So once we get those answers, then we'll know whether antibody testing or eventually immunity passports could be something that are present in the future. But it's a bit early right now because if we can test for antibodies and get that information, we may not know the relevance of what that means. So this is under, under study. And there is an encouraging trial right now where they have taken blood, blood plasma from patients who've recovered from COVID, so that would contain those antibodies, and they're infusing it into patients with active COVID infection as a treatment, as a study treatment. But it's still, um, as I said, it's under investigation to see whether or not this is effective or not. But if we look at our numbers now in Canada, we have approximately 70,000 confirmed cases of COVID in Canada. And with our population of approximately 38 million, that means that less than 1% of Canadians have had that COVID infection. So even if we do get immunity from the infection, still 99% of us do not have immunity. The other thing we know about this virus is there's no specific approved treatment yet. Um, the basics of fluids, rest, oxygen, analgesics, and, uh, and ventilator support are the mainstays of treatment. But there are many, many studies underway right now. In Canada, we're part of many of these drug studies in the hospitals, uh, in our key centers, and around the world but none right now are approved or have been proven to make a big difference in the treatment. So the trials ongoing right now are remdesivir, which is an antiviral, you've probably heard about that, hydroxychloroquine, some medications that are actually being used right now in the treatment of HIV, and others that block inflammatory response, but none are yet approved for general treatment, but they are part of clinical trials being offered to people in treatment centers and hospitals. The vaccine is one of our biggest, um, biggest focuses right now, and that would be a major game changer because once we have a vaccine, then we can get immunity and get what we call herd immunity where the majority of the population um, is immune and that prevents spread and transmission in general populations. 
And there are many uh, countries working on vaccines right around the world. And many of them are cooperating together and certainly uh, trying to fast track uh, the production of these vaccines. There are companies now that are in the stages of actually producing the vaccine as they're still working on it and trialing it because they want to uh, make sure that we can get that into production as soon as it is approved. But we don't have any information right now on when that will be. Uh, there are predictions anywhere from six months to 18 months, but it certainly isn't going to be anything uh, in the next month or two. So we know that despite moving into this early stage of reopening, 99% of Canadians are still at risk of getting the virus. We have no immediate vaccine yet on the horizon. So it really does remain important to control the rate, uh, or that rate of transmission so that we can prevent another wave of COVID and certainly prevent a surge. So this is why our public health advisory is important. And this is why things are moving fairly slowly as we move into these phases. One of the things that I think we're very privileged in Canada is that we really have an excellent public health system, a public health agency. Um, one challenge we have is that many of them are provincial and so that there are also different ages and stages, so to speak, of this virus in different provinces. We see that in testing. Uh, the numbers and criteria for testing vary province to province. But we do know one thing, that the more testing we can do and the more information we can get about the virus, then we hopefully will see provinces continue to expand their testing as more availability is present. But some of our provinces, well, all of our provinces really are at different stages along that infection curve, depending on when it arrived in their province. So this will result in different timings for stages of reopening in each province. But the principles are going to be the same. They're really consistent. This reopening process is going to be very gradual and it's going to be in stages. So the businesses that open in the first phase, they will really need to uphold those public measures that we've talked about with the physical distancing and having employees wear masks if it's not possible in that line of work. And as well, making sure that there's hand hygiene present for everybody to use on a regular basis. All provinces then, as we move into this first phase, are going to monitor the results and see what happens before they determine the timing for phase two. It takes a minimum of two to three weeks to see the manifestations of any changes we make. And that's because of that incubation period of the virus. So there will be a monitoring period once we move into phase one that will be longer than that. And that will determine the success of the first phase of opening. And if it's successful, we'll carry on and move to phase two. If it's not successful, then we do have a risk of going back to some of the previous restrictions you know, that we've been living with for the last uh, couple of months. So every business and every person's individual action really is important through these early phases of reopening. If we don't follow them and we just take this as a license to go back to what we used to do before COVID days, uh, we do risk a surge because the virus is still in the community. And if this results in increasing infections and deaths and threat to our hospital and medical system, uh, we will likely see a tightening up of some of those public health measures. So this is with us for a number of months ahead, and we really need to adjust to this new normal for the foreseeable future. So I wanted to give a little bit of that kind of the medical background so it makes sense as we look at moving into businesses, you know, what, what are important considerations to look at. So I'm going to turn it over to Maria now to look at some of the business point of views and considerations as we move into this phase of reopening. Thank you so much, Wendy. That was really insightful and certainly I'm appreciative of constantly being able to get the update from you. And, and the most challenging, I think, thing for individuals is that it seems to change uh, quite frequently, right? As they, the public health uh, officials understand more about the disease itself and about the virus itself and how it is working within our populations. Um, we're evolving and how we approach these situations are evolving. And so um, I do certainly appreciate your counsel and your update on this on a regular basis. You know, what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on is things that organizations have to consider as they look and plan for bringing their teams back to work. And, you know, I will say up front that um, 
some of these things, you know, Wello is an expert on the medicine side, the medical side of this. Um, but you would have access to other advisors as well uh, who would be able to help you with this. So, for example, your benefits and your HR advisories. Um, they certainly, and I've seen a number of them, have come out with, you know, guidelines and things to consider as well. Um, in addition to that, you know, as we work through some of the things that you might want to consider doing, I would also recommend that you speak and seek legal counsel on some of these things. So all this to say, you have a lot of resources at your disposal. Please make sure that you do use them and seek their counsel. Uh, they certainly are looking and planning for this as well. So to get us started, there are a number of things that we think about as we're bringing more places back into the actual work environment. Um, and we at Wello and at Lin InLive are literally facing the same questions and considerations that organizations uh, at large are talking about as well. So, you know, initially where I would start is I would think through what your unique office setup is. So are you in an office building that you share with other companies? Are there elevators? Are there shared staircases? What are those ways that an individual is going to get into your office environment? Or are you in a standalone building? Or do you have a dedicated street level entrance? Are you a manufacturing site where not only do you have individuals that come and work within your environment, um, but they rotate through the day? You have different shifts. Maybe you have contractors that come into your site as well. Are you a warehouse where you are constantly moving a product in and out of your environment? Or are you a remote location? You know, do people um, fly into your site and do they stay there for a, a few weeks and then leave and then come back after a couple of weeks? Um, so, you know, the starting place that I would look at is what is your unique uh, environment and start to think through what are the potential exposures to others? Um, so, you know, as we move on to the next thing to consider, uh, as you look at re-entering the physical workspace, is how do you put in place physical distancing? So, you know, we've been told two meters. And so, do you set up your workplace differently as a result of that? If you're in a, an office environment, do you set up your desks so that people can uh, be at least two meters apart from each other? Do you make sure that, you know, as someone walking down the hall, that they don't come within that physical distance space of an individual who's actually sitting at a desk? If you are having meetings, do you hold them in a large open space so that you can all be two meters apart? Um, is the space that you have, you know, you may have a small boardroom, that is fine for two people, but it wouldn't enable four. So the physical distancing is something that's really important as you look at planning a return to your physical workspace. Um, some organizations are thinking about things like hours of operation. So do we extend those hours of operation over and above the nine to five? Um, you know, do you have a, a group of people that start at 6.30 and they work until 2.30? And then at 2.30, there's a second shift, so to speak, that comes in. Um, do you do a phased return to work? So you have your most essential have to be in the office people first. And then over time, as our restrictions are, um, are relaxed a little bit more, then you bring on others. Do you have a rotation? So you have, you know, one week, you have some people that come in two days a week, and they're working from home three days a week, and then you flip that the next week. So there's lots of ways that you can consider how you bring people back in, in terms of when they're physically in the space, that will help you to facilitate and to maintain those distancing practices. You know, the other thing as well, and certainly we're doing this on the InLive uh, clinic side where we are an essential service, and so we do have our clinic open, um, but we have drastically uh, upped our cleaning protocols. We, you know, we've always had very high standards from a cleaning protocol point of view, but now we have someone who literally walks in and uh, wipes uh, door handles and hard surfaces with cleaning product to make sure that if anyone has touched them before another individual has an opportunity, we actually have had that, uh, that physical surface cleaned. Um, that is something that you know, is certainly available and I would advise you to consider what are those things that you can do. 
The other is around what we call PPE or personal protective equipment. So these are things like masks and gloves. Um, and, you know, in some cases, uh, wearing some type of gown, uh, if you were in the medical world. You know, there has been a lot of talk and discussion around things like masks. It's just really recently in the last few weeks that the decision has been made by the public health officials that um, wearing a cloth mask will actually uh, provide some help and support in terms of those situations where you can't physically distance. So even considering whether or not, you know, for an individual who's going off in an elevator, whether or not you recommend that they wear a mask. That certainly is something that you could consider. I will tell you that uh, with gloves, and certainly Wendy, you're free to jump in here, gloves are uh, meant for a one-time activity use. So an individual coming in and wearing a gloves for the entire day won't help keep your surfaces uh, safe from any you know, viruses or disease or bacteria that they may pick up along the way. Uh, the next one is really around common spaces. So your reception area, maybe your kitchen. Um, you know, reception areas uh, can be redesigned so that an individual who is waiting, they um, are not within two meters of somebody else. Potentially you could put up a plexiglass piece in front of your receptionist so that when they're greeting people, when they're taking deliveries and the such, they do have a physical barrier similar to other you know, grocery stores and pharmacies. They have a physical barrier between the individual who's in front of them and themselves. And finally, deliveries. So, you know, Wendy did speak to having hand sanitation uh, stations and lots of hand sanitizer and lots of opportunity for, for people to wipe and wash their hands. Similarly with deliveries, particularly if we think that there is a possibility that virus uh, may actually exist on that cardboard box for a period of time. You know, some uh, may make a decision that all deliveries are set aside for a period of time before they're then taken out. Others may say, no, we're gonna wipe them down with some type of disinfectant and we're gonna go from there. But certainly as you're thinking about people re-entering your physical workspace, these are the kinds of things that you uh, may want to consider. Um, I was gonna say, Sean, I think we've jumped through one, there we go. So the other hot topic, and certainly Wendy referred to this with respect to testing, is how do we minimize the risk of having COVID-19 in your workplace? And I will tell you that there is no equivocal way to say and to guarantee that an individual who feels well before they come to work are not within that 48 hour window when they may actually uh, develop symptoms and they are able to, to um, pass on the COVID germs. And so, you know, there's not a way that we can guarantee that someone isn't coming into the workplace, but there are some things that we can do to mitigate risk around this. So the first one is testing versus self-reporting of symptoms. So, you know, um, Wendy spoke about some of the antibody tests and certainly we've received a number of calls asking, is this a viable way to help keep COVID out of our workplace? Today it isn't viable because, well, we, we may be able to determine if an individual has uh, antibodies. We don't quite know what that means in terms of immunity. We also don't know what it means in terms of whether or not they have the antibodies, but they're still actually able to shed the virus. They're able to pass that virus on to others. And as well, it's very difficult to get access to these testing facilities. And certainly in Canada today, uh, you know, it's my understanding that we are not able to access those tests. So testing seems to be um, of antibodies is not something that's an option for us. I have heard of some workplaces um, testing temperature. So, you know, before you come into the workplace that, uh, you know, they take your temperature. But the challenge with that is that not all people who have COVID-19 actually have a fever. Maybe they don't have a fever in that moment. And so, <clears throat> So then it takes us to a place where, is there an opportunity for us to ask individuals based on their self-reporting, you know, they're putting their hands up and saying, I have symptoms or I don't. Is there an opportunity for us to use some of the public health tools to look at those guidelines and say, 
is an individual safe to go to work or not? And so, you know, when we look at the public health advisories, and I will tell you, we look at them every day. Uh, Dr. Smelser probably spends a couple of hours a day on them. Um, they tend to change with frequency, and they can be very complex to understand. So it's important that whatever you put in place, that you're able to follow the public health advisory. <clears throat> Certainly, I've heard of some manufacturing sites where, you know, an individual uh, fills out a little survey before they go in and they, you know, then go to work. The challenge with that as well as you look at doing it um, at the organizational level is that you need to make sure that the feedback that you're giving that individual is appropriate in terms of whether or not they can go to work. And I will tell you, even at Wello and at InLiv, we are looking at this uh, with a deep dive in the moment. And I do anticipate that we will um, come up with some support, because we're in the process of designing it right now, support for our customers around how to bring their employees back into the workplace in a way that minimizes uh, as best we can the risk of an individual being ill as they come in. Um, but even as you do all these things, so you know, let's say that there is some type of survey that's available that enables um, us to say yes, based on public health guidelines, an individual can or can't go to work, we have to be really cautious on maintaining employees' privacy. Um, you know, there are a lot of individuals that you work with. 54% uh, of people actually have um, a chronic disease. And in some cases, that chronic disease would put them at a higher risk of contracting COVID. And because of that, they may not be uh, the best people to bring back in your first phase of returning back into a physical workspace. But in many cases, those individuals may not want to self-identify. So how do you help to maintain employee privacy? What information can an, an individual company reasonably ask for? Um, and whether or not uh, some of that is actually best being asked and managed by a third party? Because medical health information is private and that is, it's not appropriate to share that with an employer. What is potentially appropriate to share with an employer with consent is whether or not an individual is able to go to work based on um, a set of questions or symptoms uh, guidelines based on the public health advisory. So, you know, all this to say, I think there are some options and some opportunities for organizations, certainly will help where we can. Um, to mitigate the risk of bringing COVID back into the workplace as people come in. There's so lots of things you can do in terms of physical space and cleanliness and cleaning protocols and all of those things. But there as well may be some opportunities for uh, some survey, uh, surveying of individuals before they come into the workplace. What we need to do though, is to make sure that you also have a plan for who can't come back into work. And so that's not something that, um, from a medical point of view, Wello could help with, but certainly your policy, your HR policy advisors would be able to support you on that. And here's the bottom line on it. Whatever you do needs to be implemented really, really well. Um, you know, we know that in order for new things to happen, uh, that the guideline is very clear from our advisors that you need to put things into policies. Policies need to be implemented uh, very, very carefully. And you know, even for those organizations that have had to deal with safety sensitive workplaces and the you know, legalization of cannabis as an example, and you know, where they would have zero tolerance in the past, they, can, they could continue to have zero tolerance, but they needed to make sure that the policies were very, very well written, very clear, very explicit, and then from there, implemented and clearly understood upfront by the individual. This is the same kind of situation. And so, um, you know, the bottom line on it is that we say, please consult with your experts. You have medical experts, you have legal experts, and you have HR policies advisors. Please make sure that you go out and consult with them. They will not only help and guide you, but they'll help you to make sure that whatever you choose to do, whatever you would like to do is within the parameters what you're allowed to do. Um, and as well that you can maintain employee privacy, that you have 
you know, all of those permutations uh, and understanding of what your next steps to need to be if an individual can't come back to work, is there an opportunity for them to work remotely, so on and so forth. And so, you know, just to make a little bit more of a fine point on it, you do need to consider your high risk employ employees. 54% of all employees in Canada have at least one chronic condition. If they're 55 or older, 69% have one or more chronic conditions. Now, not all chronic conditions will put them at a higher risk, but certainly there are some that are very well documented and we are learning more each and every day. Hypertension, kidney disease, diabetes, heart disease. These are, and uh, you know, anyone who would be immunocompromised, um, all of those situations will actually potentially put the individual at risk if they were to come into contact with COVID. Now, all of the things that you're doing to keep your workplace safe, uh, all of those things that you're doing uh, to keep the workplace um, free from disease uh, will go a long way to keeping everybody within your organization safe. The other thing as well is you need to have a plan if somebody gets sick while they're at work. You know, that is, it's not every illness is going to be COVID. Some illnesses just may be a common cold or uh, some type of other ailment. But you do need to have a plan. So if someone is, you know, living at home and going to work, then you send them home immediately and you recommend that they either consult with public health or they consult with a clinician. Uh, if they're part of the Wello program, please have them connect in with us and to self-isolate self until they've had that conversation. If they're eligible for testing and if they do test positive, then public health will step in and help to advise you as to what other measures you may or may not need to take within the workplace. If you are in a remote location, so this is the fly-in, fly-out fly camps. It is, you know, could be an oil rig. It is somewhere where an individual can't easily go home. Um, then you need to have an isolation space set up that they can completely isolate. And as well, then we would advise that you consult with your medical advisors. Uh, in most cases, in a remote site, you will have someone who has a medical uh, expertise and you will have uh, already in place an escalation process in the event that you needed additional help. And here's the thing, it's important to continue to provide your employees with ongoing support. Certainly we know, uh, and we see this in our own organizations, um, we over communicate today to our teams. We keep in touch, we make sure that at the beginning of meetings, um, particularly when it's just a couple of people, that we do that mental health check-in. How are you doing? How is everybody coping at your house? Those questions go a long way. They go a long way in helping you identify somebody who may be at risk. They go a long way in the employee feeling like they are supported and that they have a real partner there. And I will tell you, based on the questions and the additional requests for support that I have seen uh, through our well of service from our clients, I think employers are really going out of their way to do an exceptional job on this. Um, I'm also happy that you know we have the new wellness mental health support service that the federal government has put in. I've gone in and explored on their you know, first few pages. Um, there is a space there if you think that somebody is in crisis. There is space there as well for someone to ask and get additional ongoing support. So lots of really good resources that are available. I also know that many organizations have EFAP programs. These programs, um, certainly the ones that we have partnered with, have done, uh, gone out of their way to make sure that ongoing support is available. And finally, be flexible and supportive. If an individual is really reticent to come back, you can hear fear in their voice, it's possible there's something else going on. So find a way to enable them to talk about it without necessarily having to fully disclose uh, that they have a chronic disease that they feel may be career impacting, so they don't want to actually go to that length to tell you. Um, we have found, and, and certainly with our leadership team, you know, and, and Wendy, that we are really going out of our way to do these things for our teams, and we have found it to be exceptionally effective. So that's really the end of what I have to say. Um, 
we're uh, thrilled to take whatever questions that you have. I know that uh, we did receive some questions as well beforehand. Uh, Wendy, why don't you join back in and we can go through those. Great. Well, thanks, Maria. Very, very practical um, outline of the things to consider. And, and if you really stop and look at those recommendations, they're really the foundations of trying to maintain those public health advisories in a workplace setting. So when we look at it, really that comes down to, if you just keep those public health advisories in your mind and base your decisions around that, you're going to end up structuring things in a, in a healthy way for your uh, workplace and employees and your home. As well. You know, that's Absolutely. it. That is so, uh, that's so true, Wendy. And, and certainly, you know, most larger organizations or organizations that have a high degree of safety sensitive positions, they may already have a health and safety team, right? And mm -hmm. this is an extension of that team, um, certainly. But for those that don't, there are resources, there are tools uh, of your advisors, and they will actually help you. And in some cases, they may just have guidelines that they provide to you. In other cases, if you need them to, they'll actually come in and consult and advise on the return to work. Exactly. And we're also starting to see that some of the government public health websites for each province, as they're moving into this reopening, they're starting to put some guidelines out for a very specific industry. I know, uh, I can speak for Alberta is opening some of the, uh, uh, the service industries, such as hairdressers, and they've actually started to put some very specific public health recommendations for them. So always remember too, to go to the public health websites. There is a, a lot of information there that you can tap into for your, your business and your resources as well. Absolutely, Wendy. And for those, um, those organizations that uh, need a quick way into that, we actually have a number of resources on the Wello site. So wello.ca, uh, both for employees as well as employers, and a lot of those links are already in there. Yeah, I'm just going to make a quick comment about the the masks and gloves that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people get a false reassurance that wearing glove and mask protects them. And if we look, let's get to gloves first, because gloves really they're designed to prevent um, entry into your skin or a little nick on your skin or um, any, any fluids that might be um, infective, but we know that COVID does not enter through the skin. It's a respiratory virus. So it, what it may do is allow your hands to be clean when you put a glove on and you have to hand sanitize before you put them on. But then you have to actually think about them just like being hands. If they touch something, the glove will pick that virus up. Just because you're wearing gloves, if you then touch your nose, mouth, or eyes, you can still transmit that with gloves. So it, Gloves are not um, going to be protective unless you continually change them and you need to hand sanitize to change them. So they're just like adding a second skin for you. Now, if you're dealing with infectious um, things such as blood or body fluids that could enter through the skin, that's where gloves become protective. Um, but masks, um, as you know, very controversial throughout the last couple of months and the guidelines mm -hmm. changed as we learned more about the virus. So now knowing that it is asymptomatic transmission, meaning people don't necessarily have to have symptoms, uh, the initial recommendations were put a mask on if you had symptoms so that you, you kept that sneeze and cough material in your mask and you didn't spread it out. But now that we know that it can be through asymptomatic transmission, breathing, as we say, moist talking, you know, if you <laughs> tend to have a bit of secretions when you talk or even laughing, you can actually have some of that droplet expel. And if you have asymptomatic transmission or at the couple of days ahead of time, the risk is there. So really wearing a mask is not protecting the person wearing that mask, it's protecting the people around you. So there's a question about safely returning to work in a public building. And I think you've addressed a lot of those things there, Maria, but I do think we'll start to see public buildings having markings for distancing. We no longer will have those packed elevators where everybody is shoulder to shoulder in an elevator setting, limiting the number of people in elevator settings. You know, making sure you hand sanitize um, before you enter a workplace uh, so that if you've touched a button, if you've touched a door handle and your hands are clean, wash them, hand sanitize. Um, masking, now that we see that transmission as we talked about, perhaps wearing a mask when you're entering that public building because you wanna make sure that you're protecting those around you. And if everybody wears a mask, 
you're protected as well. Mm -hmm. um, any other factors you would bring out, Maria, for just entering a public building workspace? So I think that really much, pretty much covers it, Wendy. Uh, you know, it's how do you go up in the elevator um, safely? How do you go through a staircase where you may pass somebody safely? And so, you know, yes, it is the things that you've already identified in terms of sanitizing uh, the hands and potentially wearing a mask in that in elevator. But it's also, you know, taking the onus upon yourself not to get into a crowded and potentially to wait for that next elevator where there may be one or two people. You know, things are gonna take a little bit more time, certainly, in terms of getting in and up to your floor, um, but at least it can be done in a safe way. Excellent. Um, this question is well about testing and availability of testing. And uh, right now, uh, all testing is really um, administered through our public health agencies of each province. And you will see that the guidelines have changed. For example, in Alberta, they've really opened it up. And as of yesterday, anybody can go and get tested. They're trying to determine, um, they're going to limit it to 1,000 people per day, but without symptoms, without contact, without anything, because they're trying to gather information. What is the rate of people carrying the virus? But you'll find other provinces may not have yet expanded the testing. What we all um, you know, would love to see is that we could have what we call a point of care test where perhaps you know, in the future, could we one day even have a little station where you went in and everybody got tested, whether they boarded a plane or went into a workplace or went into a retail store, but we don't have that available yet. There are many, many under development at the time. You know, we saw one that uh, got released in Canada a couple of weeks ago for, for large scale. It was going to be mainly through government initially. And uh, because these take time to develop and if you test them on 100 people, you may not see some of the challenges that come out when you get mass screening. So lots of these point of care are under investigation or under development right now and being tested, but we don't have a retail one yet available just for us to use in Canada. So everything now is still through public health agencies. The other thing to take into account, if we do testing, we need to know that that test gives accurate information. Um, you know, some of the test kits that have been released uh, for these retail um, operations, you know, in the U.S. Uh, in particular, some of them may have 15 or 20 percent uh, false negatives. Well, that doesn't help us because we then may let people in that tested negative. So we need to make sure before we get into point of care testing at work sites or, or for public places that we have something that's first of all fast. We can't uh, have something that takes an hour or two hours, that is considered fast uh, right now when we compare to the type of testing we're doing in laboratories. But to have somebody wait an hour to enter a venue could, you know, would not be practically speaking something of value. So we need to make sure that they're accurate, that they are fast, and that they're not so expensive that we couldn't do it mass. So there's certainly many things under development and it may be a very different uh, discussion we have on this in three or four months time as uh, things come available. So um, another question uh, that's come about is, um, what are some of the ways to support employees with the anxieties associated with returning to work? Um, safety precautions and communications regarding them demonstrate care, but they can also add stress and worry to an employee coming back. So I'll put that one over to you, Maria. <laughs> well, you know, that's a really good, it's a tough That's one. <laughs> a, wait, you know, it, it is a tough one. And it goes back to a few things that uh, we've talked about. The first one is having the right things in place. So at least they can see that you have gone that extra step, that you're doing everything you can to mitigate risk. Um, I think that's the most important one. The second one is having open, honest communication. And I can tell you what we've done here at In Live Wello. Um, you know, we're fortunate in that we have fabulous, fabulous clinicians. One of those clinicians is a psychologist, and she's actually doing a specific program that is available to all employees and to their families around DBT training to help them manage through those anxieties. So when you feel that physically, what do you do? Um, you know, we're very fortunate we have that resource at our fingertips, but certainly organizations can uh, help to continue to provide help by 
ongoing communication, having open dialogue, listening under what the individual has to say. And so, Wendy, you know, it's mm -hmm. how often do we have this conversation at the end of the day? How are you doing? Um, and we're not just wait listening for the, oh, I'm fine, because that our natural reaction is, oh, I'm fine. I should be fine with all this stuff going on. Um, but taking a moment to go a little bit deeper. And then when you do identify somebody who is at risk, making sure that you have those process and protocols in place. Um, you know, they can maintain privacy and all of that, but most organizations do have access to resources. And if you really think somebody's truly at risk, seriously at risk, uh, then make sure that you are getting them to help as quickly as you can. Um, and so that's how we do it. And, and for some organizations and for some individuals, knowing more makes them more anxious. In some cases, those individuals will choose to just assume you're doing all the right things and come to work every day based on that. Yeah. And I think we're going to see just general anxiety, not even just for the workplace, but going out into, for example, a retail operation that maybe we haven't um, you know, been part of those things for the last couple of months. So I think we will see an, a, a general level of what we call social anxiety as we start to enter just some of the things that we automatically did in past. And I think the important thing to know is that everybody is in this together. I know we hear this all the time, but it's actually true because everybody is experiencing this for the first time. This is a new situation. And, uh, you know, fear of that unknown, when we know what we're dealing with, it's a lot, a lot easier to handle it. But when we don't know, it brings about that feeling of anxiety. So I share exactly what you say. Talk about it. You know, if it's specific to the workplace, talk to your manager or your somebody that you, know, you can confide in and trust about your concerns about coming back. Hopefully that they can assure you that they are doing everything to make that work space as safe as possible. And I think if you're very familiar and very comfortable with the, um, the public health advisory measures, they're not just motherhood statements, they're there for a reason. I tried to, to position that so everybody understands why they're there. And if your actions really support that, in all ways, you're doing what you can. And I think it's important that you reassure yourself that you're doing everything in your power to make sure that you're doing things to keep you safe and your workspace and your family and your, your friends safe. There, there is a question about uh, best practices. Can I go visit my mother now? Um, can we share a meal together or not? Um, if I just wash my hands when I arrive and don't hug, is that safe? And you know, again, it's putting that public health advisory. We would not recommend, and I know it's going to be hard. We've had Mother's Day just pass. Uh, we have a, an upcoming long weekend, but keeping those principles in place. So many provinces have very specific guidelines as to how many. Some provinces, it's five people can get together, socially distance, um, not you know hugging and and uh, sharing utensils or food and touching the same things. Some it's 10 people, some it's 15 people. Um, and one province is up to 50 people now. So it's looking at the public health advisory for your, your uh, neighborhood. But yes, of course, you can now visit somebody safely as long as you know that you've been following public health measures, they've been following public health measures, and you get together in that controlled environment. Few people, space outdoor spaces tend to be a safer place to get together because there is more air circulation and virus as we know it it only goes about two meters and if we've got lots of circulation we can clear it a little bit faster so sometimes even having an outdoor walk with somebody where you're physically distanced by six six feet or two meters um, you know having an outdoor um, get together on your deck with another person that you know is not been uh, out and about but has been following the public health advisory these last couple of months you can start to re-enter and that's what we're talking about this cautious re-entry now it always is important when you're looking at parents or grandparents that you take into account their level of risk because somebody as we know over 80 is very high risk should they be exposed so these are ones you may want to have more careful consideration and uh, and uh, many of the long-term care facilities, et cetera, still have those visitation restrictions in place for that reason. But well, and I know, sorry, Wendy. I, yeah, I was gonna say, and also if you're sharing a meal, it's important not to 
uh, buffet style share utensils that people handle and then the next person comes and serves themselves. You know, I think it's, it's controlling that environment of touch and distance. Ahead, well, and I, I know that, Wendy, you know, some provinces like in Newfoundland uh, and in New Brunswick, you can expand your bubble. So you can expand your bubble with one other family. Um, you know, there was a lot on social media in the last couple of weeks um, yeah. where these heartwarming videos of people expanding their bubble with grandparents and the such. Um, certainly we can, with the specific pro provincial guidelines, look at doing that. I know I'm in Ontario and I did see someone uh, come through with a comment on it, Ontario. I'm in Ontario. I'm not allowed to go see my parents who, you know, are at high risk literally because they're older. Um, we do a lot of Zoom meetings <laughs> with them and, uh, and Zoom cocktails on Mother's Day. Um, and with my neighbors, you know, we are 10 feet apart from each other and, and we will have a, a social mm -hmm. break once in a while. It's certainly not to the extent of what I'm accustomed to for social interactions, um, but at least it, it is something. And, you know, in Ontario, we, t we continue to be told, stay with your immediate family. Do not go outside of your bubble. I am madly awaiting the moment where they tell us we can double our bubble, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. And as I said, each province is at a different stage, but the principles will be the same and it's going to be gradual. So right. it really is important. And even as we move into this first phase of reopening, you know, we're still encouraging people to stay home when you can. This isn't um, now that you can just go and take advantage of every activity out there. And you know, if you can work from home and it doesn't impact your, your, work, uh, your workplace, we're still advising that you know, as we move into these early phases. So you know, um, it's just a new way of living and this new way of living is with us for a while. The virus, as I said earlier, it's not gone. We've just managed to control it. So we're trying to control that re-entry and those public health advisories remain important. Another mm -hmm. question, just I know a lot of our questions, I've kind of tried to pick the ones that are, were encompassing because they kind of in groups um, with some of that. But one is very specific is how can Wello help remote employees and factory workers? Yeah, so that's an excellent uh, question. And, you know, what I presented earlier in the discussion was kind of that ge general getting people back to work. Um, you know, I would actually suggest that you reach out to your account manager. We are putting together a return to work program and protocol, which we can talk about. It's very early stages at the moment, but it really is designed to help to mitigate the risk of bringing COVID into the work the physical workspace. Uh, remote environments and um, factories are very, very complex, particularly since most of those organizations have had to continue to work. And in many cases with remote locations, you may have people flying uh, that would be coming from across the country. And you know we have to make sure that you are taking into account of those provincial guidelines. Um, you know, I know that some of the East Coast provinces have mandated a two week, uh, containment self-isolation if an individual comes from anywhere else doesn't matter if they came from the next province and so uh, you know that may change somebody's work uh, structure in that they may fly to Alberta and work for two or three weeks and then fly home for two or three weeks now flying home means that they don't get to go home anyway and so those are the kinds of things that you need to consider but certainly reach out to your uh, wello team members we're happy to have the discussion and we'll help in any way we can and i think we will see the travel advisories and travel restrictions we're certainly not going to be uh, changing in the near future as we move through these early phases so um, you know personal travel business travel we're not, we're not going to uh, be seeing any of those lifted. I think borders were uh, certainly a contentious issue right now. And, uh, but for business travel, you know, Zoom meetings, I think are the way of the future or you know, telemedicine uh, is the way of the future right now and something that is our new normal. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so it looks like our time is, uh, is just about up here. Maria, thank you. You always bring such a, a great uh, level of expertise and experience to these uh, conversations. Really appreciate that. And thank you, And we appreciate Andy. all of our attendees today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I wanna remind you, we do have that hashtag Wello community that we'd love you to participate in. We're trying to uh, build a positive community. So share positive images, 
positive messages, positive thoughts, how you're doing your workplace. That would be a great thing as you re-enter. How did you set that workplace up? And uh, we really want to remind you as well, stay healthy, stay safe. We've got a long weekend coming up. Every action you take, please keep that public health advisory in mind because that's what's going to make a difference and allow us to continue these new phases of reopening. So thank you and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.